You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Our opening prayer is from the book of Job. As for me, I know that my vindicator lives, and that he will at last stand forth upon the dust. Greetings and welcome to this series on the book of Job. This is the second of two parts, and so if you have not listened to the first part, it is strongly recommended that you do, because this second part will presume that you have listened to the first part and have picked up on some of the main ideas that are there, which will be developed further as it goes through. We've seen that we have to shift gears a little bit sometimes, especially when we look into the Old Testament, because their point of view, their perspective is so much different from ours, not just simply because it was pre-Christian, but also to just their world view. Now, we've seen that in the ancient world, there was a much closer connection of cause and effect. And they saw God, or the gods and goddesses, if it was in a pagan culture, as being much more involved sometimes in the world, and especially in its evil. And this could be disconcerting for us in the modern day, and especially for Christians when we think of a loving God. So we've got to be a little bit more open-minded, perhaps, a little bit more understanding of where they're at, as we would say, for this. And so, and taking a look at the arguments that will come up and the debate that's going on, it might seem rather strange to us, and we need to take that into account. What the author of the book of Job is doing is trying to answer some of the theories that were common at that time about these topics and to try to understand them, try to refute them. The author of Job does not agree with everything, but yet these were things that were common thoughts at the time, and so he has to deal with them. And so keep that in mind, and it will help to be able to clarify a, a lot of positions And that as we're going through, we're uh, working through the arguments, the basic structure and everything is all part of the first uh, talk that was given. So I'm not going to repeat all that. I am going to just remind of a couple of things to keep in mind, besides the fact of the different perspective, that the uh, author of the book of Job is a great writer, And he is writing great literature and using a lot of literary devices that are still common today in some ways. He uh, is able to give a narrative drive by moving forward and having Job push the envelope, as we would say. But then he has to back up a little bit as well. And this going forward and back gives a narrative drive to the story that's there. And also, like a good mystery writer, the author of Job leaves clues and hints all the way along. So I remind you of that, to keep that in mind, and I will be pointing that out as we continue on. And so, in picking it up here, we've taken some time for a reflection, and questions have been raised actually through the long history of mankind, about the idea of suffering, theodicy, the idea of a good God and evil things happening in the world and reconciling these things. Those are the kinds of issues that the author of Job is trying to deal with. And so to refresh the memory of those who uh, have listened to the first part and also to, to... Remember that these are amongst the main themes that we need to keep coming back to and keeping in front of us all the time for that. Now, we're at chapter 21 in our consideration of the book of Job. And in chapter 21, Job goes in a different direction. He wants his friends to hear him out. 
and that at least will be some consolation for him. If it's not going to solve his problems or help him, it at least will in some way console him. And he says in chapter 21 in verse 4, Why shouldn't I be impatient? Because his friends have been, again, representatives, the three friends of the conventional wisdom. And they've been using that and arguments from that conventional wisdom. But Job has been able to show where that is inadequate. And that's not helping him. And that's not giving him the answers. And so he is impatient with his friends sometimes. And he gets in sharp debate with them, as we've seen already. And we'll see again as we continue on. And in chapter 20, Zophar, one of his friends, gave examples of the wicked being punished. In chapter 21 now, in Job's reply, he gives examples of the wicked who do very well. And in their pride, they don't need God or don't seem to need God. He points to the wicked who get away with their wickedness. What about those who prosper from their wickedness? Why do the wicked... Keep on living, grow old, and become mighty in power, he says in chapter 21, verse 7. He's making some pertinent observations that are still very much uh, apropos to our own day and age. Questions like this are still raised. He shows how well the wicked can do for themselves in verses 8 through 12. They see no need for God in their lives. They live out their days in prosperity, he says in verse 13, and tranquilly go down to Sheol. That was their idea of the place for the dead. And the author of Job does not go into much of that or any kind of an afterlife. He stays with the present world, the present day and age. In verse 14, If they say to God, Depart from us, for we have no desire to know your ways. In verse 15 of chapter 21, What is the Almighty that we should serve him? And what do we gain by praying to him? Questions raised hundreds, thousands of years ago, still very much apropos in our own day and age. People raise the same questions and make the same statements. Basically the idea, everyone is going to die. So why make the effort to be good? Again, the author of Job is not dealing with an afterlife. He doesn't deny it, but it's not his concern. He is more concerned with the here and now and how to get through suffering and calamity now, not in a far-off time of heaven or some type of judgment that will set everything right. He's not that concerned with those things. Again, he's not going to deny it, But it's not his concern. His concern is the here and now. So everybody's going to die. Why make the effort to be good? It doesn't seem to get you anything better. So Job is pushing the notion of justice in all this. Again, he's pushing the envelope. He's going forward. He's questioning. He's probing. And then sometimes he'll have to back up a little bit. So it's two steps forward, one step back. He thinks that his friends are in error with their examples of the wicked being punished because he can match their examples with those of his own about the wicked doing quite well. In verse 33, or 23 of chapter 21, one dies in his full vigor, wholly at ease and content. His figure is full and nourished. His bones are moist with marrow. Verse 25, another dies with a bitter spirit, never having tasted happiness. Alike, they lie down in the dust, and worms cover them both. There seems to be, therefore, no difference between the good and the evil, at least not from the point of view of here on earth. Everyone is equal in death. So, it brings the question, why be good? It's also similar to the pagan idea of, a, of God or a goddess or gods being capricious or not caring. Nothing makes any difference, and some pagan writers put that forth. Job uses himself as an example, as a matter of fact. 
He did nothing to deserve his fate, yet here he is suffering as if he had been terribly evil. Many today would agree with Job and his sentiments. Chapter 21 closes with Job bitterly remarking to his friends in verse 34, How empty the consolation you offer me! Your arguments remain a fraud. The third cycle of speeches begins with chapter 22. Eliphaz goes first again. He simply hectors Job to admit that he was wrong. You thought that you could hide it. In chapter 22, verses 4 and 5, Is it because of your piety that he reproves you, that he enters into judgment with you? Is not your wickedness great, your iniquity endless? Verses 4 and 5 of chapter 22. The friends still can't move beyond thinking Job is in some way responsible for his suffering. So then Eliphaz tries to be helpful by giving a list of possible sins. He lists both sins of commission and omission. Think of the Gospels and the scene on a day of judgment. The criteria may be what one failed to do, the works of mercy, and those who neglected the least brethren. They are condemned for what they neglected to do. Here, Aliphaz is trying to be helpful by providing a sort of examination of conscience. He chides Job for thinking God wouldn't see his sins, but God does see, and he will punish the wicked. God will settle with the wicked. And in verse 19, Eliphaz says that the innocent will be happy for that. Now, that's a strange note in our Christian way of thinking for us. But yet, it was a part of their conventional thinking at the time. And it's seen elsewhere in the Old Testament, especially in the Psalms. In the talks I gave on the Psalms, I went into this a little bit and explained and showed some examples of this. The psalmist wants to see the wicked get punished. He doesn't want to do it himself. He wants God to do it. But he, the psalmist, would like to be there to see it. So Eliphaz tells Job to repent before it's too late. In verse 23, If you return to the Almighty, you will be restored. If you put iniquity far from your tent. Chapter 22, verse 23. While it's obscure here, A clue is given in verse 29 that will be made clear later. In verse 29, we read, For when they are brought low, you will say, It is pride, but downcast eyes he saves. We'll see that developed a little bit more, quite a bit more, really, as we move on. But in verse 30, Eliphaz is back to the conventional wisdom. In verse 30, He will deliver whoever is innocent. You shall be delivered if your hands are clean. Job replies in chapter 23, but he doesn't really want their help. As Job sees it, the problem is that he cannot get to God to state his arguments. Here is the legal motif again that we've seen before in the book. He states that if he could speak to God, God would listen to him. In verse 6 of chapter 23. Would he contend against me with his great power? No. He himself would heed me. Verse 7. There an upright man might argue with him, and I would once and for all be delivered from my judge. Job thinks that he would certainly win his case in court, but he can't find God to get him to listen. So Job simply states again his innocence. He does not reflect on the helpfulness of the examination of conscience. But if Job can prove he is right, then the only conclusion is that God is wrong. Job is not yet at the point of saying that explicitly, but at this point he is implying it here. He is blaming God for his suffering for the way he feels. He then backs up because he fears what further troubles God may have in store for him in verses 14 to 17. 
In chapter 24, he pushes further once again and takes a new tack. Now he puts forth the idea that maybe God just doesn't care at all. Before, God just somehow didn't know what was happening to Job, or so he thought. Job gives examples of the wrongs that people get away with. He surmises it might be because of the cover of darkness, so God doesn't see. But Job quickly dismisses that. In this, the author is answering one of the pagan theories. In verse 12, God doesn't seem to mind even when he knows what is happening to people. Now he knows, but he doesn't care. Verse 12, In the city the dying groan, and the souls of the wounded cry out, yet God does not treat it as a disgrace. Some other translations say he doesn't treat it as unseemly. Job continues for several verses about how the wicked can carry on. Yet, he realizes they will be gone like everyone else. Verse 24 and 25. They are exalted for a while and then are no more, laid low like everyone else. They are gathered up like the ears of grain, they shrivel. If this be not so, who can make me a liar? and reduce my words to nothing. Job has gone a step further. First, he proposed that maybe the problem is God just didn't know about his troubles. Then, he realizes that probably God does know about his troubles. And now, he knows, and he doesn't care. So you can see the progression. Other cultures believe this, and even today some might entertain the same thought. Deists believe that there is a God, he created the world, but now he lets it run by by itself. The author of Job is examining these possibilities, but he's rejecting them. So through Job, he must look elsewhere and he must look deeper. The answers of his time are not adequate. The author is not agreeing with these answers, but recognizes them and examines them. Actually, if God does not care, Job's quest to speak to him about his case is futile. As Christians, we believe God does know and does care. In chapter 25, Bildad gives his third speech. It is brief. It is not that God doesn't care. It is his overwhelming majesty and greatness which makes us insignificant. He cites as an example the parts of heaven, so vast, yet these must seem very small in the perception of God. How can anyone be right or innocent before God? Again, here is a hint. Verse 6, how little man is before God. We read, how much less a human being who is but a worm, a mortal, who is only a maggot. Job answers in chapter 26, And he backs up a little bit. Job cannot admit that God doesn't care or that he is too important to be bothered. So Job gives examples of God's power in creation. He can be and is involved in the world. This is crucial for Job. Job really cannot take the position that God doesn't know or doesn't care. If true, This would end Job's striving to be heard. It would be the height of futility. Job would have no rationale to continue to implore God. Job must not abandon the belief that God does listen. Job is frustrated because God has not answered and helped him. He cannot hold the position that he is wasting his time. The matter is would end right then and there for Job. But we do not comprehend him. Again, a hint from the author. Verse 14. Though these are but the outlines of his ways, and what a whisper of a word we hear of him, who can comprehend the thunder of his power? 
The whisper and the thunder comparison is powerful imagery. In chapter 27, the text seems mixed up. We need to clear it up a little bit, and it's really it's very simple. Take chapter 27, verses 13 to 21, as Zophar's third speech. And Job's reply is really before it in chapter 27, verses 1 through 12. So in the textual work of it, it got reversed there. And this happens in other places in the Bible as well. So again, Zophar's third speech is verses 13 to 21, and Job's reply is 1 to 12. They're just in reverse order. Zophar states that even the descendants of the wicked suffer for their ancestors' wickedness. The wealth of the wicked will be given to those more worthy. Again, Zophar follows what the conventional wisdom will hold. Job replies then in verses 1 through 12. In verses 5 through 6, Job claims to his dying day he will hold to his innocence. Chapter 28 continues the theme of riches, but metaphorically, not material wealth, but the riches in having wisdom. Verses 15 and 16, you cannot buy wisdom, nor can it be found like silver or gold. Verse 23, it can only be obtained from God. Creation theology is again the perspective, as we have seen so often before in Job. God is described as a master craftsman who designed and built the created world. There is wisdom in the works of God. He put it there. Man learns of this wisdom and that it begins with the fear of the Lord. In verse 28 we read, And to mortals he said, See, the fear of the Lord is wisdom, and avoiding evil is understanding. With chapter 29, the speeches of the three friends are done. Job now goes one-on-one with God. This will continue to the end of chapter 31. The friends are not mentioned. Job pines for the days of yesteryear when God was on his side. He exaggerates, but his feelings are genuine. He catalogs all his past achievements. Elders sat at the gates of the city to conduct business, to decide legal issues, cases, settle disputes. Job was given marks of respect by these elders, and young men as well, when he came by. They listened to what he said. They didn't argue his points. Job may be exaggerating, but he did have some basis for boasting. He was treated like royalty. He did many good deeds. He gave generously to the unfortunate. Some of this was said of Job in the prologue. We've seen it already. Even God was impressed with Job's piety, you remember. And above all, Job observed the law. Verses 12 and 13 mark out three special groups, the poor, the widow, and the orphan. In the Old Testament, in all parts of it, the narrative, the prophets, and the wisdom writings, these three groups are special. They are the special concern of God because they have no one else to depend on, so they turn to God. And so they are in his special care, in his providence. And so others must care for these three groups as well. In verse 23, Job says that people drank in all his words like a thirsty person taking in water. But in chapter 30, the tone changes. We get clues, new clues, to Job's character. His pride comes through unmistakably. He rants against the very people who gave him the honor and respect in the preceding chapter. He is suspicious of these very people. He thinks they have turned against him behind his back. Verse 1 of chapter 30 is a key clue for us. 
But now they hold me in derision, who are younger than I, whose fathers I would have disdained to rank with the dogs of my flock. Job is bitter, and he turns his venom towards others. He denigrates people for no reason, only as he imagines them. True enough, some people would have looked askance at Job's dilemma. Some would have been smug about it, perhaps. Some would have even mocked him or taken pleasure at his expense. But not everybody. Some would have pitied him, and perhaps no more. Others, though, would have been truly upset for him. They may have been at a loss for words to encourage or even been shocked by his appearance, as were the friends at first. They just didn't, wouldn't know what to say. But they certainly would not be thinking of taking advantage of him or making him the object of derision. They may have been silent, speechless, yet inside, not laughing, but crying. Yet Job is becoming almost paranoid. In verse 10 of chapter 30, They abhor me. They stand aloof. They do not hesitate to spit in my face. He exaggerates, for instance, his weight loss due to his suffering and sickness. In verse 18, With great difficulty I change my clothes. The collar of my tunic fits around my waist. He's lost so much weight that his neck size is the same as his waist size. And in all of this, Job wonders, where is God? Why doesn't he help him? So now, Job takes a step forward and starts to accuse God. His whole whole attitude changes for the worse. And this is because of his suffering. From verse 19 to the end of chapter 30, at verse 31, Job recounts his suffering at the hands of God. Job grieved for the trials of others. Shouldn't someone, especially God, care for his troubles? In the prologue, Job maintained that he was innocent, and others, including family, God, himself, and even the devil, concurred in his blamelessness before all. Even God vouched for Job. As things fell apart for him, he remained unperturbed. But as things go from bad to worse, he becomes impatient. The author is making one of his main points. That is, when things are going well, it's easy to be devout and pious. When Job was successful, he was charitable and magnanimous. When he basked in the accolades of others, he was kind and generous. But when things get rough, he folds. He lashes out at imaginary enemies and friends and finally even at God. It's easy to be pious when you're doing well. Truly, Job was blameless, but not now. When put to the test, he fails. His sin is pride. He has lost his exalted status amongst his peers. He ranks them with his dogs in that most telling verse. Dogs do not fare well in the Bible at all. He relished the marks of honor and esteem, and certainly not all have turned on him. His friends if they haven't been all that helpful, have tried to console him and help him as best they could. But it wasn't enough. Yet their motives were sincere. All the while, they stayed with him. They didn't get up and walk away and leave him to his misery. Job is his own worst enemy. He didn't listen to his own words, which were clues or could have been for him. His failing did not cause his suffering. Job feels everyone, everyone, even God, is taking pleasure in his misfortune. He has been humiliated. 
There's more self-pity than there was in the prologue. In chapter 31, verse 6, he begins to and tries to defend himself again. Verse 6, Let God weigh me in the scales of justice, thus he will know my innocence. Job gives a negative confession, a list of things he did not do, things he is not guilty of. The list is extensive. He denies not helping the poor, the widow, and the orphan. Denies engaging in idolatrous actions, hurting the innocent, and a whole list of other sins. If he had done evil, he could see God punishing him. But not having done these things, Job pushes again. The only conclusion is that God must be wrong. Job goes further than he ever did before. If Job is not to blame, and someone is, it must be God. In chapter 31, verse 37, Job wishes to take his case to someone else. Of all my steps, I should give him an account. Like a prince, I should present myself before him. We see Job's pride again. Not the humble supplicant, but rather he comes regally. No beggar is he, even before the throne of God. Now we see more clearly Job's failing. And his failing didn't cause his suffering. And Job was right in this. Give him his due. His suffering caused his failing. In the face of his suffering, we see his faults. Job pushes the farthest. Using legal terminology, he dares God to answer him. He challenges God. In the Hebrew of the original text, what Job says is comparable, tantamount to an oath. This is my final plea. Let the Almighty answer me. In Israelite tradition, oaths are not taken lightly. By an oath, one called upon God as witness and involved God. That's why if an oath was taken falsely, you are asking God to do wrong. That's not what Job is doing here. But he's taking an oath, and he is directing his oath against God. It's one thing to ask God to be witness of something, and it's something far further different to take the oath against God. And that's what he's doing. And so he's gone as far as he can with this. He's pushed about as far as he could. And again, his failings didn't cause his suffering. It was the suffering that caused his failings to come out. Now we hear in chapter 32 a totally new voice. A new character, heretofore unseen and unheard. Elihu has been listening all along. We did not know this. This has led some to believe that he is not a part of the book of Job. But most scholars hold that Elihu does belong. The friends are finished speaking. They can say no more. Job has bested them or just ignored them. Their answer is that Job must be guilty of something. But we have seen that he's not. He truly was blameless, at least at first. The blame that they're looking for For causing his suffering, Job is not guilty of that. So their premise does not hold up. It's not until after the suffering is well developed that we start to see the faults and failings. So we give Job his due. He was right in saying he's blameless. Even God said that about him. And so did the devil, remember, in the council. Give the devil his due, though, besides that. He seems to have been correct in another way. Remember, Satan said earlier in chapter 1, verses 9 to 11, that Job was pious because things were well with him. He was right. But he also said, torment him and he will turn against God. It seems the devil was right after all. Conventional wisdom and his friends have failed Job. His friends are at a loss and are upset with Job. Elihu is upset too. It drives him to come forward. 
He explains himself as respectful of Job's status and the fact the friends are his, that is, Elihu's elders. So he didn't say anything. Out of respect, he is merely observed and not participated. But now he feels he has to speak out. Immediately he takes the offensive. Age does not assure wisdom. In verse 14, Elihu says he feels the friends were inadequate in their answers. We read, For had he addressed his words to me, I would not have answered him with your words. Elihu will look back by summarizing what the friends have said and will anticipate what God will say in reply coming up. It is time to take a new approach to Job's predicament. In chapter 33, Elihu goes directly at Job. Age has not given Elihu stature before people, but he has the Spirit of God. This makes Elihu able to stand his ground before Job. He will engage Job in debate as an equal. Elihu begins by turning Job's own words against him, and this unsettles Job. Elihu will say, You have said in my hearing, and then he will quote Job's own words and use them against Job. An example is in chapter 33, verses 8 and 9. But you have said in my hearing, as I listen to the sound of your words, I am clean, without transgression. I am innocent. There is no guilt in me. And Elihu refutes that. In verse 12, Let me tell you, God is greater than man. God speaks to us, but we are not disposed to listen. God speaks once or even twice, and we don't listen, he says in verse 14. Elihu suggests that maybe God is trying to teach Job something by his trials and tribulations. In chapter 33, verses 15 through 28. In verses 31 through 33, He says, listen, I will speak. Then if you can answer me, that is Elihu, Elihu says he would like to see Job satisfied and justified. But if he cannot be justified, then he needs to be quiet and listen to Elihu. Elihu will teach him wisdom. The friends had not been so direct. Elihu is not trying to humiliate Job. He truly would like to see Job better off. In chapter 34, Elihu demonstrates what he has been trying to say. The ear tests words as the taste tests food. We use our senses to discern. So let us learn what is good. Verses 3 and 4. Elihu quotes Job's own words to him in verse 5. I am innocent. God has deprived me of what is my due. For Job to to claim such is blasphemous. He drinks in blasphemies like water. In verse 7. In verse 10, Elihu reminds that God cannot do anything wicked. Verses 10 through 13, certainly God cannot do evil. He punishes those who do. Elihu also disagrees with the notion of Job that God does not notice or care for us. In verse 21, His eyes are on the ways of man, and he beholds all his steps. Elihu seems to be turning against Job in verse 35. He states that Job is adding rebellion to his sin by addressing many words to God and not listening to the arguments put before him. Elihu believes Job has compounded his offenses. First was pride, and then arrogance, and now is added obstinacy and rebellion. So it seems that Job really is not blameless. Yet we were told in the beginning of the story that he was blameless. He falls apart when trials begin. This is the main theme of the author. When all is going well, it's easy to be pious. Job is a kind of fair-weather friend to God, we could say. 
The irony is that when Job finds life difficult, the very time when many would turn to God for help and strength, Job does just the opposite. The irony cannot be missed. Tragedy often brings people closer to God and others like family and friends. But for some, the opposite happens. They turn away from those who could help and support them and even turn from God. So Job is not different from many others, even in our own day. Elihu keeps up his attack on Job. In chapter 35, verses 2 and 3, Elihu bluntly asks if Job thinks it right to say he is right and thus God is wrong. Is there no difference between sinning and being good? (coughs) This answers one of the pagan thoughts noted earlier, that it makes no difference whether one is good or bad. The author is refuting that approach. In verse 14, Elihu tells Job, Your case is before God. Wait trembling. That is not in arrogance, as we have seen. For Elihu, this is Job's failure. He will not wait. He will not listen. He will not learn. In chapter 36, Elihu will not let go. He says he isn't finished yet. Verse 2. Wait a little, and I will instruct you, for there are still more words to be said for God. He refers in verses 9 and 10 to Job's sin of pride. He lets them know what they have done and how arrogant are their sins. He opens their ears to correction and tells them to turn back from evil. He reminds that God teaches what is right in verse 15. But he saves the afflicted through their affliction and opens their ears through oppression. Those who are sinful are the angry ones, and Job is angry. So it is Job's own fault for acting against God and thus feeling the way he does. Job has actually made himself feel miserable. And in this, Elihu has hit the mark. Job's ego and self-esteem have been wounded. Instead of trust and humility, Job has anger, self-pity, and resentment. Elihu goes on to speak of the greatness of God for the rest of the chapter. Elihu is following creation theology, God's activity in creation. He is also giving clues to the final answer. Things of power in the sky, such as rain, clouds, lightning, thunder, These show how much greater God is than us. In chapter 37, the rumble of thunder is like God's voice. It causes us mortals to tremble. Forces in nature are awesome, and God created them and controls and uses them. This should overawe us, yet Job would argue with such power. Verse 5 is a clue to the final answer. God thunders forth marvels with his voice. He does great things beyond our knowing. And in verse 6, he says to the snow, fall to the earth. Likewise, to his heavy drenching rain. God does wonders beyond our knowing and searching out. Verses 14 through 16 give more clues. Listen to this, Job. Stand and consider the marvels of God. Do you know how God lays his command upon them and makes the light shine forth from his clouds? Do you know how the clouds are banked? The marvels of him who is perfect in knowledge? Look at the wonders of the world. Do you know how God does it? How he makes these things and controls them? Do you know how God makes sunlight or forms the clouds? Elihu finally ends his argument in chapter 37, verses 23 and 24. God is preeminent in power. We revere him even though none see him, however wise someone might be. So Elihu makes the following points. God is far above us. We can know his existence. 
We cannot know things as he knows them. God is too exalted to be affected by us. Yet God does care about each of us. God answers our prayers, but not always as quickly or in the way we would like. God is just and does reward good and punish evil. For Job to challenge God is to add rebellion to his pride. Elihu speaks from his youth, so he's not held to the conventional wisdom. He does not deny the conventional wisdom, but he doesn't limit it, as Job's three friends did. They can't get beyond Job having done something prior to deserve all this grief. They think that they are helping by trying to discover Job's guilt. But Job's guilt only comes after his pride is wounded. He cannot meet the challenges to his pride. His pride was there before his troubles, yet the friends cannot get beyond a cause and effect relationship between sin and its consequences. He wants to know what he did and how it is proportionate to the punishment he received. Elihu is more open-minded. There does not have to be a direct correlation between sin and punishment. The author of Job is not concerned here with a final retribution after a final judgment. Again, he limits his view to simply what is perceivable on this earth. However, it may be unmerited and undeserved. How one handles adversity is the test of character. A true understanding of the conventional wisdom would not contradict this either. Finally, in chapter 38, God speaks. He speaks through a storm. The author uses anthropomorphisms, human attributes given to God. It's the only way we can do it. They knew that God was totally other, but these anthropomorphisms make God real. Make him a person, not an it. So the relation to God can be personal, between persons, God and us. God has emotions and reactions. It is a way to stress the importance of the relationship. Yes, God does get angry. Yes, he does love. It is, the author depicts God as being upset. God turns the tables on Job. God will ask the questions now. Job, the accuser, the plaintiff in this trial, now becomes the defendant. In verses 2 and 3, Who is this who darkens counsel with words of ignorance? Gird up your loins now like a man. I will question you, and you tell me the answers. Chapter 38, verses 2 and 3. God refers to creation, as did Elihu. He mentions nature and wonders. Where was Job at the creation of the world? The image is that of an artist creating a work of art, or of a craftsman planning and then building something, more like a builder. In verses 4 through 6, the measuring, a foundation being laid, laying a cornerstone, building a structure, From the building of the world, God asks if Job ever made the dawn appear. Can Job make hail as God did to win a battle for Israel? A hailstorm routed the enemies of Gideon in the book of Joshua. The reference is chapter 10, verse 11. After asking if Job can control the weather, he asks about guiding the stars, directing lightning, Then, coming down to earth, what about providing for wild animals and birds? Can Job do that? Chapter 39 continues a litany of natural phenomena. This is a device used by other biblical authors, and it's called an onomasticon. O-N-O-M-A-S-T-I-C-O-N. Literally, it's a list of names. It's a list of things that have some order or relation among them. And it was a way for them to learn natural science. So the author of Job begins with the heavens, goes to the skies, 
and then to what's on the earth. It is a way to see priorities, relationships, and the phenomena of nature. And so you start and continue on through. The questions are multiplied, and of course, Job is unable to answer. God overwhelms Job with all these examples. Modern society may think it has or can find all the answers to such questions. And while our modern scientific knowledge can understand how many things come about and function, and our modern technology can modify many things in nature or change some aspects, yet there is still much that escapes our understanding and our control. We are no closer to knowing such things about our world than the ancients sometimes in this regard. We certainly understand more, but we often cannot control more. The examples are multiplied. We can today produce machines with hundreds or thousands of horsepower, yet we cannot engineer a horse. We can make things, we can make some changes to nature, even large ones, but we have no total control. And many things are way beyond us. Actually, our great scientific knowledge should lead us to a sense of awe and reverence for the wonders of nature. It should lead us to respect God, not attempt to replace or thwart him. Our millennia of knowledge should, if little else, teach us how much we don't know and how much and how little we really do control. Job cannot do any of the things God asks of him. So then God will not answer Job. God does not defend himself. He has no need to. God never refers to Job's situation or his complaint. God never explains why people suffer innocently. Ironically, the very things we would most want to control are the very things over which we have the least control, like the weather and other things as well. Chapter 40 begins like a previous chapter. Will Job argue and criticize God? In verse 7, Gird up your loins now like a man. I will question you, and you tell me the answers. Chapter 40, verse 7. It repeats chapter 38, verse 3. Will Job condemn God to show he is right? This is what Job has done. In order to preserve his image, He has blamed God. Job cannot blame himself. And he is right in a way, since he seemingly did no wrong. Yet he lacks humility and the strength to bear his troubles. He cannot accept what has happened to him. Instead, he lashes out at his friends, at people in his community, and finally at God himself. In this, many wild animals are used as examples. Behemoth could be likened to a hippopotamus and a leviathan to a crocodile. And there's a wry comment that the author has about leviathan in chapter 40, verse 32. Once you lay a hand on him, no need to recall any other conflict. We cannot tame or control these animals. And that, and you won't have other have time to worry about other things if you tangle with the Leviathan. And he continues in chapter forty-one with Leviathan. It is an exagger an exaggerated description of this beast. Verse eleven. It seems more like a dragon than a crocodile. Out of his mouth go forth torches, sparks of fire leap forth. In verse eleven, and it goes on at some length. In verses 18 and 21, it is invincible. Man cannot control such a monster, but it's nothing for God to do that. And so finally then we have Job's repentance. In chapter 42, Job regains his senses and repents. Verses 1 through 6 are his confession. He has overreached. He retracts his words and repents. He realizes he has gone way too far. Job received a theophany, T-H-E-O-P-H-A-N-Y, 
a manifestation of God in the world. He has been overwhelmed by it. He has seen the power of God in nature. Job says he has heard of God by word, been taught about him. Now he has seen God in the sense he has had a personal experience, a manifestation of him through this theophany. It takes all of this to finally get through to Job. Job admits he has looked at things far beyond his understanding. This is one of the points the author is trying to make. And so we come to the epilogue. It begins in verse 7 of chapter 42. God speaks about the three friends, and God rebukes them. He is angry because they have not spoken rightly. They could not get beyond the conventional wisdom. They could not move beyond a strict cause and effect. Elihu is the only person who's not rebuked. He saw Job's fault. The three friends are to ask forgiveness from Job. And it is very striking that they are commanded to ask Job to intercede for them so they will not be punished. The relationship of community. The plea is accepted and they are forgiven. The final verses are almost anticlimactic in the light of what has gone before. Job has everything returned to him and more besides, sometimes double the amount. The book closes with chapter 42, verse 17. It tells us that Job lived 140 years and saw his great-grandchildren. No details are given as to how he started a new family, but everything is replaced. He lives a long life, and in verse 17, we are told he dies old and full of years. In the Old Testament, to live a long time was seen as a special favor from God because God was the giver of life. And so if he gave you a long, long life, he was especially blessing you. The years are not to be taken literally. A reflection. Job does have a great fault, and it is pride. But it also only manifests itself when he is tried severely. Yet he does learn finally, and his faith grows stronger and more mature. He is a far better person for his experiences. He went beyond his bounds, but was able to return. He learned his lesson. His pride is tempered by humility. He pushed the boundaries, backed up, and then pushed again. He pushes as far as possible when he challenges God with an oath something considered blasphemous. But note well, Job never totally rejects God. He always keeps the line of communication open. If he decides God really does not listen or care, he has lost his case. He questions, he doubts, he swears, but he never quits. He never gives up. He cannot take the position that God does not listen or care. Again, if he entertains this, he has lost. Job continues his case because admitting God does not listen or care makes all his efforts futile and worthless. Also for Job, by the way, suicide is not an option. Job received a theophany, and these are rare and reserved for one who has faith. And a theophany always changes a person. Think of St. Paul on the road to Damascus. God would not give a theophany if he didn't care, if he was cruel or he was capricious. He grants it because he cares and sees the faith of the person. Think of Moses in the burning bush. We see how this theophany for Job has changed his attitude and thus has changed his life. Job has questioned three things. One, the harmony of deed and consequence. Two, 
the abilities of man and our possibility to control our destinies. Three, the control both ways of God over us and the attempt of us over God. This is what the author is dealing with and probing. And Job learns three things. One, there is not always a causal link between deed and consequence. Good deeds do go unrewarded. Evil goes unpunished. There is not always strict distributive justice. The world is often a messy situation. Job wants strict justice, but this is an ideal, often not the reality. The same is true today, of course. Justice is not the fundamental reality of our existence. Job has tried to make justice his God. The world is not chaos, but it is not perfect either. Far from it. To strive for perfect justice in an imperfect world is to make justice, law, and order our gods. 2. As to the abilities of man. What are the limits to our possibilities? There will always be boundaries, as the Greek tragedians well knew. We can stretch the boundaries and make progress, but we can also go too far and bring havoc on ourselves. Job tries to make the world to his own design. He wants reasons for everything. The unexplained has no place in Job's life, especially when it intrudes and takes away his comfort zone. Third, finally Job wants to be in control, to control all, even God. Job puts demands on God, not only to answer him, but to see things his way. But we cannot force God to act as we would have him do. To do so, we would not be created in the image and likeness of God, but we would rather be creating God in our own image and likeness. Rather than learn who God is, we would make him be whom we wanted. Job has been given hints throughout the story. But he doesn't heed those hints, even when he is the one who is mouthing them. He doesn't listen to his own words. Some commentators would say that the book of Job gives no answer at all to any of the questions Job raised. Some would omit all of Elihu's discourse. These would end the book with Job's summary and his challenging oath to God. But Elihu's speech and the appearance of God in the storm are necessary to complete the story. Yet these commentators who would leave it out are correct in a way. Job does indeed receive no answer. God does not explain himself, nor does God tell Job how to bear his trials. God does not owe Job, or anyone else, an answer. Rightly understood, this does not lead to despair, but rather to faith. God alone is almighty. He alone can be trusted in all things. Nothing else is perfect. What does our Christian perspective add to this? We have been told, my ways are not your ways. Above all, God is mystery. He loves us so much, he sent his son to suffer and die for us. This is beyond all, and it is impossible to explain in purely human terms. There is no greater love. Jesus is the suffering servant of Isaiah. He is the sacrificial lamb of God. In the eyes of the world, the suffering of Christ was inexplicable. He was one who was so kind and gentle, so full of goodness and love. Yet his enemies prevailed over him and put him to death. On the surface, it seems all so senseless, such a waste. Yet for those who have faith, it is the most meritorious act ever. Job does not wait for an afterlife when possibly all can be set right, a perfect world. He asked for someone to plead his case. It is Christ who pleads our case before his heavenly Father. Even our seemingly meaningless sufferings 
can be united to his and become meaningful. This does not remove suffering or explain it as Job wanted, but it helps us to bear it and assures us that our suffering is not in vain if united to the sufferings of Christ, whose sufferings merited salvation for the whole world. God does listen, as so fervently Job hoped. As one commentator said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me, becomes instead, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. So Job did not receive an answer, at least not the one he was expecting. The answer is that there is no answer. But that fits our human understanding. This may seem empty, but it fits. Job examined the answers that others gave in and out of his tradition. Some people today try the same answers or others and get no further. To learn there is no answer in terms of this world is in the end to learn wisdom. Hello, God's Beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.